appreciate it. Again, spoiler, container security, it's all about the supply chain. And it's a cooking theme. Of course, it seems like everybody uses that. So let me talk a little bit about myself. Again, to expand on what John said, I'm a currently a security architect, a chief security architect. And I like to think of myself as a professional contrarian. I have had a, a podcast in the past. Uh, some people actually have found it. It's been about 10 years. Um, I'm a blogger, a B2B writer, and uh, just your regular infosec Benny Jesuit witch. Um, I tend to focus on best practices, and I have been a former Unix engineer and network engineer, so I can get pretty nerdy when necessary, and this is how you reach me. And I, I will have slides online at some point, somewhere, somehow. We want to start out with a, with a short poll. Um, I wanted to find out where everybody's organization was in terms of using containers. Uh, one, two, and three. One, just getting started, mostly using in development as we refactor applications for cloud native. Uh, two, evenly split between containers and full VMs uh, and or bare metal with an OS and an application stack. Or three, what's a container? <laughs> and that will be going on and then I'll, I'll let uh, John step in with uh, that, the results of that poll in a couple of minutes. But I'm gonna just move on because uh, we're a little compressed probably for time. So the supply chain, the software supply chain. What, containers are software? Sorry, they are. Um, so in case you're not very familiar with what a typical software supply chain is, I of course have arranged to have that represented for you with commonly used tools. Basically a software supply chain is a set of processes that build a product. Um, your typical CI CD pipeline, as you'd like to think about it, you know, where you have deliver, deploy, um, where you, and typically people split up um, in, in get very, they get very upset about the D in CI CD, right? Is it deliver, is it deploy? Most people separate those through release management criteria. But again, you'll see your typical tools, your JIRA for plan, Confluence. Um, you'll see uh, you know, your IDEs for code, uh, your source control systems like uh, GitHub, you know, Jenkins for building for CI, uh, possibly CD, Travis CI, which is a big favorite. Just so that's what you need to think of as your software supply chain. If you're, if some of the people here aren't as familiar with the software development uh, process. Um, now we, that we've looked at the software supply chain, let's break it down a little bit into a container supply chain. I'd like to think of the entire software release process, what everybody thinks of as a software development pipeline, as a pipeline of pipelines, um, because you have, you, know, you have infrastructure as code and one of the sub pipelines that you're going to have is your container pipe supply chain, your container pipeline. And so you'll see I've broken it up into a software pipeline section where you make say your war file as an example, and then you build your container and you with your war file, you get an image, you test your image, and then you publish it to uh, an image repository. So let's talk about some standard supply chain threats that you typically see. Um, I've pulled this from the Salsa security framework, which is a supply chain um, security model. Uh, I highly recommend it. I think it started out at Google, but now it has multiple contributors from uh, private industry. So A, you bypass the code review. That's a really important element. Maybe you do manual code review for certain elements, um, but there is an area where you somebody could take advantage of that, especially uh, with the new uh, BD algorithm uh, vulnerability that people have seen out there. It, it, you, without someone really digging into the code, you, you're likely to completely miss it. And you may miss it even with a manual code review. Um, B, uh, a compromised source control system. Uh, somebody's uh, compromised your GitHub repository. Maybe there's a uh, typo squatting attack. Um, C, you've, somebody's modified the code after the source control. Ideally, when you, your source code should be uh, certified or attested. And in a situation 
where you're not really doing that, you could uh, have code that becomes dirty or drifts after uh, source control. Um, you could have a compromised build platform. There are plenty of vulnerabilities out there uh, regarding Jenkins um, and Travis CI. Uh, e, you could have a bad dependency. I think everybody today is pretty aware of the, the threat against open source software dependencies. Um, just the other day, uh, NPM had an announcement of uh, a problem with, um, with some malware embedded in some commonly used uh, NPM modules. Um, you could bypass CI CD completely. It should be pretty difficult to do that, but it is still possible depending on the maturity of the environment. Um, you could have a compromised package repo uh, where you store your containers, or you could be, if you're pulling down a public image, that could be compromised as well. Um, you could just have a bad package, but that's just a few of the elements of, of where you could have typical threats against your supply chain. Um, you also, uh, this is a great document from NIST. Um, I recommend it highly, Defending Against Software Supply Chain Attacks. I think everybody's very focused on supply chain attacks, given some of what has happened uh, in the in the marketplace recently. Um, this covers uh, not just um, written code. I mean, it, it it also talks about design elements. It talks about hardware devices. Of course, SolarWinds is on here. It talks about end device end user device malware. For example, if um, you have a developer who has um, an infected desktop or laptop. Um, there's, you know, a, a, a pro there, they call out the Kaspersky antivirus uh, problem where it was banned actually in the US for uh, various reasons. But you get an idea that uh, when you consider the supply chain, you're thinking about every process element in the delivery of software. So again, um, example of some uh, Trojan, uh, of Trojan source, uh, the bi-directional algorithm in the Unicode specification, which allows reordering of, of characters through control sequences. And you can use this to create source code that renders different logic than the logical ordering of tokens ingested by compilers and interpreters. Um, this is a frightening attack, right? Because uh, because of the heavy dependency that most software projects have on open source software. And it's very difficult to detect. Um, right now, I think the only uh, compiler or interpreter that, sorry, that's been uh, adjusted, I think it was um, Rust, I think has this detection now, but it's still, everybody's pretty much scrambling with regards to this uh, vulnerability. So, what does supply chain security mean? We've talked about um, essentially the uh, what a software supply chain is, but let's talk about the secure elements of a supply chain. It means adding assurance to the software development process, creating uh, confidence and trust in the source material and the practices used. It's you're you're trying to get a holistic, um, high level view for protecting each phase in the software development lifecycle. And you're approaching the SDLC as a set of business processes. I think this is really important. I think um, as technologists, we get very caught up in the technology. And I really think of DevOps as a, a set of automations of business processes, right? Um, that's really what we're looking at. And when you look at it that way, then you can think about um, the securing of those processes. And it's validating the final product meets a reasonable set of security criteria to ensure that it's not vulnerable. And this is not a new thing. We've been talking about supply chain security for a very long time. Um, as long ago as uh, I, I've been sitting in on these talks with regards to network equipment, for example, and how code is delivered to network equipment and even how network equipment is built. I, I think um, it's just become very high profile since SolarWinds. So now we're in for the fun stuff. What is a container? I like to think of it as just a bunch of software ingredients. Uh, I think Docker has a really good uh, definition. Everybody knows what Docker is. I, I think uh, it, it's, it's fortunate or unfortunate. They've really popularized and um, really 
opened up the world of containerization um, through ease of use, right? Uh, they have a high level container management system that everybody has probably used at one point or another. And um, now we sort of think of a dot, we don't, we think of a, a container in the same way you think of Kleenex to tissue, right? Docker is to container. And Docker refers to it as a standard unit of software that packages up code. Uh, it's a container image is a lightweight standalone executable package of software, right? It's portable, um, it's uh, modular, and it sort of encapsulates that idea of working fast and working at velocity and, and ease in DevOps. So let's talk a little bit about uh, virtual machines versus containerization. I think a lot of people are very, very familiar with virtual machine technologies. Um, and depending on what your role is uh, in, uh, as an audience member here, what your role is in your, in your um, organization, you may be less familiar with the differences between virtual machines and containers. Essentially, uh, the most important thing to take away is that virtual machines or guests have their own, uh, their own kernel, their own host operating system. They do not share the operating system of the, of the hypervisor, um, of the, the bare metal system, right? They have dedicated uh, memory space. They have, so they, there's nothing shared there. While containers um, share a host operating system, a, conta a container runtime then is responsible for helping to create uh, those dedicated spaces, but you are sharing memory space, you are sharing a kernel. Um, this will be, become very important later as you think about the attack surface. And just to point out, we have multiple container runtimes that we'll be discussing here. There's container D, there's cryo, which is uh, a Red Hat OpenShift um, runtime that's become popularized. Um, then you have low levels like run C, you have Gvisor, you have Kata as well. So user space versus kernel space. As I mentioned, um, you're sharing kernel space with containers. So virtual machines run their own isolated kernels. There's no shared memory or execution space, as I mentioned before. Um, without the addition of, of virtual machine technologies, for example, you'll see something like Kata containers or Firecracker or Gvisor. So without the, the addition of that, of that virtual machine of like, a, they call it a, um, a micro VM, um, containers will share the same kernel. Uh, Linux namespaces, capabilities, SecComp, SE Linux, AppArmor, C groups, they can be used to enhance segregation between running container instances on the host. But you're still, you've still got that, mm, that sticking point of sharing the same host kernel. Um, so what does a container look like? Well, I like to think of it as a cake. You kind of start at the top and work your way down. And that's pretty much what happens with a container. It's a layered file system and they correspond, each layer corresponds to instructions and scripts um, or a Docker file. Um, OCI compliant runtimes, you, they use something called a union file system, which has some of the, some of the properties such as uh, it's a logical merge of multiple layers into an overlay file system, um, read-only lower layers and writable upper layers. Uh, you begin reading again, like you start eating from the top and you work your way down um, and it's copy on write. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much into detail here, but I did want to introduce something called lazy pulling. Uh, I'm not, I haven't done a lot of research yet into uh, the uh, attack surface of lazy pulling, but basically uh, as opposed to the traditional way that you, uh, you, you upload a whole container, it, it, you know, when you run it uh, and you start it with lazy pulling, um, you, do not do that, you uh, pull as needed. So it's 
breaking it up into multiple um, little uh, bundles that are grouped together logically. So it, it encourages faster start time. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Um, I encourage you to research uh, lazy pulling because it is starting to become a reality. It's not baked into the OCI standards yet, but I anticipate it, it will be. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about high level uh, versus low level uh, run times and management systems. I think this is important to understand um, because when you hear about new vulnerabilities, for example, with container D or run C, you need to understand where the demark, where the demarcation point uh, begins and ends, right? Um, for example, with some high level container management examples, uh, you have uh, the, these are referred to by Kubernetes as container. Well, it can be referred to as the container runtime interface. Um, you have Docker, which is a very high level container management system. Um, you have Podman, which is on Linux and you can uh, interact with containers. You can build using Podman or start them. Um, you have high level container runtimes, again, Cryo, uh, Container D, Docker, I know it's confusing, but there's the Docker management system. And then there's um, a, there was a Docker runtime, which was container D, but has since been donated to uh, the CNCF, I believe, or maybe the Linux Foundation, pretty much the same thing. Um, and then, and these are all part of the OCI. And then uh, you have the low level uh, container runtime, such as uh, run C, which we all know in Kata and Gvisor. Um, Kata and Gvisor, as you'll see, have uh, sandboxing or virtual machine technologies integrated into that. I think this is important, as I said, when you're looking at container vulnerabilities, because sometimes you'll have a run C vulnerability or you'll have a container D vulnerability and container D is really a wrapper around run C. You need to understand where the differentiation is when you're, understand, when you're looking at that attack surface. <clears throat> I recognize this is uh, sounds like a lot of nonsense and uh, it's a lot of detail. Um, and I put in a lot of links in my references, which will be my in my slide deck, which will be uploaded. And also as I'm going through this, it can be very overwhelming. I, I recognize that. So let's try and um, break this down a little bit. So <clears throat> where do you get your container? Let's talk about, um, and yes, you'll notice I had a dirty kitchen. Um, <laughs> let's talk about your recipes for container images. So you can pull a base image down from Docker Hub from a, from, or from another public or, pro, or registry, or maybe a private one, maybe your, your vendor that, you know, you have a vendor that you work with. Um, they've containerized their software and they have a private registry that's only available to customers. Um, and then you could, you could either add code and configuration, or you can just run it as is. You can use a multi-stage build, which is something I recommend, selectively copying what you need in the image. Um, without using a base or a parent image, you can build an entire OCI compliant image yourself with a tool like Builda. That's for the super paranoid or um, the super nerdy who uh, are not as lazy as say I am and don't want to build every and want to build everything from scratch. You can create a single layer from scratch. This is actually a thing. It's a no op. It's you're basically just uh, telling uh, the system to get a, a statically compiled binary. Um, it oddly enough, uh, that will actually send your uh, most security uh, uh, container security tools into a tizzy. They don't understand from scratch no op images. Um, you can also make a distro list image that only includes the application and runtime dependencies. So I recommend using the best ingredients, of course. Uh, you you want to use a trusted source for base images, especially as I, I'm sure people follow uh, reports and uh, the news about how you'll hear about some Docker Hub image that's been compromised and has, uh, you know, Bitcoin mining elements in it. And nobody knew. They just trusted Docker Hub and they downloaded it and used it. 
Um, you want to validate the image uh, with a container security tool. Even I would recommend, let's say you get an image from uh, one of your vendors and you're going to assume that it's okay because you got it from your vendor, validate it. I have found tons of problems with uh, vendor, vendor images, even vendor security container images. Um, I recommend using a software composition analysis tool and or a container security tool. There are plenty out there. Um, you want to economize. You don't want to add elements that aren't necessary for your microservice, right? You don't want to have unnecessary ports open. You don't want to have shells. You don't want to have... Um, I, I've seen package managers in containers. There's no reason to have that on your container image. Uh, you want to limit syscalls if you can. I know it's challenging uh, to do that, but you it really helps reduce your attack surface if you can manage to do that. Uh, parameterize, don't hard code configs or embed credentials and secrets in your image. The same thing that you would hear from OWASP regarding you know, recommendations in the ASVS. Um, okay, they, they apply here because remember what I said, right? that a container is a software package, essentially. Um, reduce, follow the principles of least uh, privilege. Don't run root processes. Don't run your container as privileged. Um, you, wanna, um, you don't want to, um, as I said, immutable. You don't want to add a shell. You don't want to log into a running instance. Um, I've been at places that had something where we, we called it um, a dirty container. That meant that we detected when somebody logged into a container or made a change, and then we immediately would expire uh, that uh, running container image. Um, you don't want to... Um, you don't want to run a shell for that very reason, right? It's just a temptation, right? Um, there are techniques, of course, with Kubernetes where you can uh, run a container exec. I don't recommend that either. There are alternative debug um, uh, things that you can do, techniques that you can use that will replicate the environment in um, another namespace or another cluster so that you can actually troubleshoot in a better way. Uh, minimize, you want to use techniques like distro lists and from scratch to eliminate unnecessary, unnecessary elements and layers. Um, you want to uh, automate. I think automation is probably one of the best elements that will help you attain uh, separation of duties. And it will eliminate errors and it will minimize uh, your attack surface if done well. Um, I, then you can also uh, integrate security validation at, at multiple phases of your pipeline as well. So fry, bake, and buy. Um, if you're familiar with uh, infrastructure as code, where you have this idea of um, baking versus bootstrapping an image, there's something similar in the concept of containers. Um, you have fried images, which are custom built or extended third party images um, deployed but changed during bootstrapping activity. Um, so, for example, if you were to instantiate an image and uh, you do an apt get, apt -get or uh, a curl, um, that is not an image that you can attest. Um, bake. Uh, that's a custom built or extended third party image uh, fully created uh, with all the dependencies as part of a supply chain. Um, it's attested and immutable. You can also buy, as I mentioned before, um, third party or vendor images deployed uh, without changes, attested and immutable. Okay, I think you know where I'm going here. Um, bake or buy, but never fry. And I, I think I just want to go back a couple. Um, so container mistakes. I want to emphasize this uh, heavily. Um, I, I think what I see a lot is people haven't sufficiently refactored uh, their applications for microservices. 
So they do a full dump of their virtual machine or AMI into a container. Uh, this is a really bad idea, not just in terms of bloat, but also as, I, as you saw that I mentioned about the best practices, um, you get a really large attack surface. Every time you add something into that image, everything that's not necessary and is present on your container image, it uh, causes, uh, it increases your attack surface, not just the bloat element. Um, you just don't want to put your entire monolithic application stack in a container. Uh, and um, your, I have this pet peeve, um, People will refer to container as the image or the running instance. Um, they're very different phases of the runtime. So let's be sure that, uh, like I'm very uh, particular, I will call it a container image and then a runtime container or a running instance. Um, I think that's important to uh, remember when you're talking about containers because it's a very precise part of the life cycle. So, um, we've talked about the recipes, we've talked about using the best ingredients, we've talked about fry, bake, and buy. I wanted to share with you a uh, sample container security validation at a high level so you understand what I'm talking about when I talk about uh, the container security supply chain. Um, <clears throat> so I've broken it up into 1A and 1B. 1A is third-party images, and 1B is a full custom-built image. Um, you'll see that I've, of course, you know, you, you can use Docker, you can use um, Builda, you can use Podman, you can download the image from Docker, you may upload it to a tool like JFrog Artifactory. I mean, there are all kinds of different ways, like some things that you, you're familiar with. There are lots of ways that you can create the image and then you can get it uploaded to a container repository. So what do I mean when I say container security validation? What that means is the container has to meet a certain set of security criteria to receive a passing score, right? And that includes certain elements. In my experience, what I've used is an overall CVSS score. And I might, for example, say that the score has to be less, it, it can't be uh, equal to or greater than seven. That's an example. I may check to see if there are any root owned processes in the container image. Um, I might also check to see that the container doesn't run as privileged. Um, and I may look through uh, the container image to see that it doesn't have a shell installed. You, most tools out there will look for all kinds of other things. You can check on uh, whether or not uh, if by, some of the open source elements violate uh, your license, your agreed licenses. Like you've decided um, certain licenses aren't okay to use in your organization, maybe because you make software. So. Uh, you can check for all of that. And then uh, that becomes part of my policy for passing or failing a container image. And then once I've done that in the actual build phase, um, it's okay to upload uh, to a repository. And then I do an ongoing scan of the images in the repository. And then when the container is deployed to runtime um, through a pipeline, um, then a runtime control, control component ensures that only security validated and even signed images are deployed and can run. Um, signing is, can be challenging sometimes depending on what your pipeline tools are, but uh, it's valuable uh, because you, it gives you a, an extra level of assurance that your image has not been changed. So, Let's talk for a minute about container orchestrators. Um, I'm sure everyone has heard of Kubernetes. That is a container orchestrator. It's not a container runtime. It will have container runtimes with it. It also has a container runtime interface to use other alternative runtimes. But I think it's important to differentiate between the orchestrator, the container runtime, and the container itself. 
Um, so the orchestrator typically handles deployment and runtime lifecycle of running instances. Now, don't get me wrong, you could just run a container with straight up LXC with, you know, you could use container D, you could use Docker itself. Um, the benefit of a container orchestrator is that it will scale up uh, your instances and scale them down to meet demand. Uh, they come with ingress and egress controllers. Uh, it will have uh, container networking. You can have uh, either overlay networks. You can have routing. I mean, far more than you would uh, have normally. Uh, you have clustering. Um, it has redundancy and availability options for your, for your hit instances and also your nodes or hosts. Uh, where uh, the orchestrator and the um, uh, and the running containers are, uh, you have load balancing, service discovery, health monitoring. I think you're getting the picture, right? That this is a complicated beast. But um, if you want containers uh, to be very resilient uh, in most organizations, you will. Then you'll usually use a container orchestrator. Um, it, you also have the benefit of um, a multi-tenant segregation option through, uh, you can use network segmentation, you can use resource restrictions, you can use tools like namespaces. Um, some examples that you're probably familiar with include Kubernetes, uh, OpenShift, um, and prior to that, Mesos and Nomad, for example. Um, cloud providers also have managed orchestration options such as uh, EKS from Amazon, you have uh, GKE, you have AKS. Uh, and the real benefit, uh, one of the benefits to these orchestrators is the ability to use policies. You can really uh, get a lot of bang for your buck uh, at runtime on Kubernetes, for example, with admission control. Uh, it can decide, it can go talk to a container security tool or a policy agent uh, like open policy agent, and it can make decisions about whether or not you, these uh, containers should run. Um, I am a big fan of admission controllers, for example, on Kubernetes. Uh, they, they provide that admission controller is exactly what it says, right? admission control. It's a last gate for a container prior to runtime. And I recommend strongly that if you're unfamiliar with admission control, uh, Kubernetes did have something called pod security policies, which has since been deprecated, but now they have, um, they have something called, uh, you have, well, you have security contexts, which were always there, but you also have um, security policies now that interact with uh, admission control. This is a complicated topic. <laughs> you will spend lots of time there. Um, so we've, I've been talking a lot and here's another moment for a poll that we can either talk about now or we can talk about at the end. Um, what container orchestrator are you using? Um, there's self-managed Kubernetes for the win, sure. If you're, <laughs> if you're willing to take on that level of, level of complexity, uh, go for it. Uh, there are cloud provider managed Kubernetes instances. Uh, if you're worried about cloud lock-in or your multi-cloud, that may not be the best um, option for you, but there are tools that can help with that. There's OpenShift, uh, which is especially useful if you're on bare metal. Uh, there's Nomad or Mesos if you're still using that. And uh, there's something called Docker Swarm, which uh, did not win really the, the orchestration wars. You can still use it. I researched this the other day. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think that's the recommendation anymore. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll look at the poll results at the end and I'll keep going because we had a late start. So the CNCF, I think if you're not familiar with that, I, I highly recommend you participate. Uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, they're sort of uh, the evangelists of the 12 factor app and uh, Cloud Native, right? Um, and they have some principles of supply chain security. So this is basically just taken from them. I'm just gonna you know, go over the concepts very quickly. Um, it's this concept of, of creating trust establishing trust at every step in the process through a combination of signing, 
um, metadata and cryptographic validation. Um, the focus that everything that can be automated should be automated and documented. As I mentioned before, um, DevOps is automation of business rules, hence the documentation. And automation helps get you to separation of duties, it eliminates errors, um, and it, it ensures that your attack surface is reduced because now you have something doing things that don't involve people touching it. Um, every step in the software build and supply chain process um, needs to be defined with limited scopes. Every actor, whether it's human or machine, needs to have clearly defined roles. It, all about that separation of duties, which then is enforced by automation. Um, and every entity in the system has to engage in mutual auth authentication. And that it's that trust but verify, right? Uh, so that no, nothing or uh, a human or a machine uh, sh shouldn't be trusted unless you can verify it. Um, the CNCF has something called the cloud native security landscape. I, I noticed uh, some questions about uh, tooling. I don't really recommend tooling. That's not why I'm here. Uh, what I can do is point you to the cloud native security landscape. There are open source and also uh, commercial tools here. They all uh, have gone through the CNCF and contribute. Uh, very, they're reputable, so I encourage you to investigate it. It's interactive, so you can interact with uh, the uh, online tool um, from the CNCF so that you can find what you need. The, uh, I know everybody's talking a lot about, um, about components right now, right? Everybody's nervous because of the supply chain attacks and um, some of the elements that I've, I've uh, talked about. Uh, OWASP has a software component verification standard. Uh, it's a community effort like all other OWASP efforts, and um, it can help in, it helps you in identifying and reducing risk in a software supply chain. I highly recommend that you uh, take advantage of this, and uh, it, it gives you a lot of ideas of best practices. Um, it, it points out good patterns versus anti-patterns. Um, and it, some of the elements, uh, some of the control objectives include uh, having centralized repositories. You really do. That's like probably one of the easiest ways because it gives you visibility over um, where everything is, right? Um, you want your repositories to use strong authentication and TLS. You want to um, have auditability and really you want, it really emphasizes code signing and verification. And I just want to point out, again, uh, this idea of signing and verification and, and assurance and attestation, that seems to be the theme when you're talking about supply chains. Um, this is from the uh, NIST SP800-190 Application Container Security Guide. I'm not going to read through this too much. Um, it's a high level sort of life cycle of how containers are created and deployed, you'll see it's very high level, right? It just says developer <laughs> over on the left. It doesn't really break it down into what happens so much, um, but uh, it gives you an idea. If you, I recommend you steal it when talking to executives, for example. <laughs> it's, it's helpful in that sense. Um, bombs, S-bombs and D-bombs. Um, I was at KubeCon and that recently, and that was a big topic, again, because of the supply chain and because of certain executive orders <laughs> from the White House, uh, given the solar winds uh, issue that, that occurred. Um, there are techniques, uh, I, I'm sure if, you, if your organization is pretty mature, they were already creating SBOMs. If you were a commercial software company, you were probably already using SBOMs or you should be. Um, but there are tools now that you can create uh, SBOMs uh, for the container itself, which is likely recommended as, uh, because what I said was, right, it's, it's, a, it's a software package. And sometimes people put too much stuff in there. And now it's a requirement in certain sectors um, to have an SBOM. If you're in the federal sector, 
uh, and you do business with the, or you do business with the federal sector, you are required to provide an SBOM with, with um, uh, each product, or you have to have it available on a website. And I mentioned two open source tools, uh, SIFT or TURN, that can assist with that. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this uh, because of time, but um, uh, I have a set of DevSecOps decisioning principles that I use. Uh, I, I think the problem that you get into with DevSecOps is that people think that they can they confuse information with a decision. And the decision, the information isn't all that useful unless you're making a decision. Um, i.e. sort of breaking a build or uh, sending, like diverting a build, right? And uh, I think that when deploying things to, as part of a pipeline, that you need to have decisioning criteria that is very clear. It's based on uh, defect principles or SLAs so that people understand when is slow path happening, when is fast path, when will my build get broken? When will it get passed? Um, I think what people mistake, uh, uh, DevSecOps, um, they think, you know, because it's on that, um, you know, the Gartner um, uh, overhyped scale, right? Of, yeah, so the thing that everybody talks about, but then isn't, doesn't, isn't very effective. I think the problem is that people just think that they push a lot of information out without doing things. And so it's less effective. And if you want to be effective, because the opportunity with DevSecOps is to optimize coverage, then you have to create decision points. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because a real world use case and you'll notice that I have decision points, right? And that's what I mean by uh, decisioning principles, right? So for example, um, this is from a place that I recently worked at. I'm not gonna say where, but um, you have the developer who uh, pushes the code, triggers the build, and you're creating the container, right? Um, you'll see the CI system, after item two, it can it goes it uses uh, an image security validation service to scan the image, and it uses a policy validation service. Maybe the policy validation checks for things that aren't checked by the security system. Maybe you use uh, something an, an uh, open source software SCA tool that only checks packages, and then you have policy validation that checks certain container specific rules maybe such as trying to run as privileged. Uh, that's why we have it separated. Uh, that's why we did separate it. Um, then you have the publishing phase uh, where you publish to an internal container image registry. Then as part of uh, your, you need to think in terms of non-prod versus prod, your development and test environment, maybe your QA environment. Um, and the goal is distribution. Right. Um, so you start with non prod, you push it to a read only registry node, you go through your secure, your testing, your functional testing. You, uh, after it passes your release criteria, I'm hoping that everyone understands release management where you have criteria that checks did it go through unit testing? Did it go through functional testing? Um, did it pass everything? Um, hopefully you're not doing too many tests. To, you don't have too many test escapes. Um, and then it, if it passes the release decision, then it's distributed or promoted to production. But you'll notice that I, I have read only registry nodes that your production and non-prod uh, Kubernetes clusters are interacting with that nothing is touching the actual core container image registry. And that's a way to ensure that you're not, um, that this is an assured image, that it's a read-only image, and that it's not uh, something that has had any drift occur. So that was a lot. 
I know, I know. Okay, now we're getting close. We're, we're uh, getting close to the end here. I know that was, uh, it might've been overwhelming to people. So I just wanna go over, I wanna, I have some reminders here. Uh, small, small, small images. It's beautiful. Make your images compact. Uh, you leave out unnecessary libraries or binaries that you don't need for your microservice. Uh, trusted registries, who do you trust? That's really important. And in case you didn't know, uh, you can actually establish trusted registries um, in your uh, Kubernetes configuration. So you can actually decline to use, if somebody tries to use a registry that um, isn't trusted, then it won't use an image from that registry. Uh, you can, you should validate your images. They should be free of uh, vulnerable libraries and components. Uh, your, and I believe that you should validate anytime there's a state change, anytime somebody touches it, anytime, you know, something is, uh, it's forked, as I like to say. Um, container images shouldn't need to run as privileged or have processes that run as root. You don't want to put credentials, keys, or tokens into your image. Uh, you want to do just in time with uh, credentials. Uh, reduce the listening ports needed in your container image. It, you're just increasing the attack surface. You want to use a standard runtime. I know this, maybe this seems obvious to some people, but not all container security tools, uh, the, the runtime ones, they don't, they basically, a lot of them hook into a runtime. And if you're using some weird runtime that's maybe new, then the container security tool might not work right? Um, a container isn't a host. It's an ephemeral drop of rain. Shouldn't be logging into it, trying to change it. Uh, it's, it's supposed to evaporate. Uh, something interesting you can do and that you should try uh, is you should regularly expire your containers. They should run, they should be changed out every two weeks, every uh, four weeks, if you can. Think this is about drift prevention. Um, only in a tested immutable container images should run in your environment. You want to automate your container builds and deploys, and you want to constantly reevaluate your supply chain. You want to threat model that supply chain because that is a process that needs to be uh, reviewed as much as your own software architecture or, or software itself. So that was a lot. Um, I appreciate everybody's time, and now I'm going to... We have